Okay, so tonight we are going to be doing a um, class that we have offered on and off for um, a couple different years now. Um, I forget how long we've been doing this one, but uh, Larissa Yonke is going to tag team this one with me. This is um, Multiplication Miracles and Miracles of Provision, uh, Supernatural Kingdom um, Miracles. So this is, uh, this is a fun class. It's not one that we offer very often, so we're excited to be able to bring that one to you tonight. I'm going to have Larissa get us started. She's going to open us up with uh, just a short opening prayer, and then we'll jump right into things. Lord, I just thank you for everybody that came tonight, and I just pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the eyes of their heart flood of light. They're going to know this part of their inheritance in Christ. Amen. Okay. All right. So you guys, we, we are living in an exciting time in the church age. The tides are turning, and believers are gaining a greater understanding of who we really are in Christ, especially within the last five or ten years. So minds, mindsets are shifting, and literally an army of believers is being raised up like no other generation. This generation that you and I are living on, living in right now, it's awakening to realize that there's a greater Christian experience to be had. Uh, no longer are we satisfied with just occupying a pew, singing a few songs, and then doing it all again next Sunday. So as believers, we're beginning to understand the reality of what's truly available to us in Christ. We're traveling in the spirit, we're healing the sick, we're raising the dead, we're casting out demons, we're preaching the gospel with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. So we're taking ownership of kingdom realities. And, and these are, you know, there's, however, there are still some things that we're not yet fully stepping into, at least not to the extent of what we're capable of. So for example, multiplication miracles and miracles of supernatural kingdom provision, those are some areas of supernatural ministry where we still show some room for improvement. So I'm going to have Larissa jump in, and she's going to talk about that a little bit more. Just do it? Yep. Okay. Before we go any further, we have sort of a fun little trivia question for you. We're not expecting anyone to get the answer, but we're going to put it out there anyways. Just on and off, a chance we might be wrong. Trivia question. What was the last recorded words of Jesus' mother, Mary, in the Bible? And no cheating, no Googling it. <laughs> Would you like to open your microphones or type in the chat about that? And Chris says, hmm. <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at that? Ah, Sylvie, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Yep, that's it. <laughs> Whatever he says to you, just do it. That's in John 2, 5. Pretty profound that those would be her last recorded words, right? So again, whatever he says to you, it's important that we just do it. That sounds like a Nike commercial. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about testimonies for a second. The Hebrew word for testimony means do it again. So for those of us who like challenges, the words do it again should be taken as a challenge. We might even call it a dare. We challenge you to do this again. Uh, we dare you to do this again. And Jesus said the things he did, we would do also. In other words, the things he did would be done again and again and again through other believers, people just like us, just like you and me. So I want you to think of it this way. If Jesus did a miracle even one time what was he speaking to us through those actions he was saying do it again uh, if he multiplied something even one time then that's an invitation for believers to do the same and interestingly enough jesus didn't perform just one miracle um, of provision or multiplication he performed several so what does that say to us it says do it again so in preparing for this class, we felt that it would be important to supply you with some testimonies from modern believers, just normal, everyday kingdom, um, people just like us who are out there doing it again. So here are some multiplication miracles 
uh, that were sent to us from inside out students, trainers, and even Facebook friends. So we want you to hear these and we want you to know that God's eager to do these kinds of things again and again and again. And he's eager to do this through people just like you and me. And, um, you know, it's interesting because scripture tells us the things he did, we would do also, and greater works would we do. So that's pretty exciting. So I'm going to have um, Larissa share three different testimonies from three different people who did it again. All right. Our first testimony is from Eric Markham. Some years back, I had learned the blessing of being a giver. We had fallen into a bad situation and money was tight. My wife told me to go to the grocery store and buy $20 worth of food. Honestly, that was literally all we had, so I took the money and I went to the store. I proceeded to buy a little bit of food, but in the back of my mind, I was wondering why I had God not given us more because I was giving. When I got to the car, I noticed something on the seat. I opened the door and I unrolled it. It was another $80. I thanked God for it, and then I went back into the store and I was able to purchase the things we needed. The second testimony is from Sandy Lynn Milks. This is a testimony of my dear friend of mine who had a meat and vegetable supernaturally added to her soup. All she had in her refrigerator was chicken, a chicken carcass and a small amount of corn left in the corner of a frozen package. She had no money for food at the time, and the Lord led her to t get out her biggest pot and fill it with water. Again, all she had was a chicken carcass, so she put that in the water along with some spices. She walked away and let it brew. When she returned, it was stocked full of meat and vegetables. I'm sure my friend would be happy to post a complete version, but I've heard it enough times that I can relay it to. And the third testimony is from Inside Out trainer Gary Jepson. I never actually witnessed a supernatural multiplication before my own eyes. I have been around it several times, soup kitchens, dinners for crowds, even a time involving my favorite pecan pie, but I never witnessed it for myself. I had always believed because scripture teaches on it, but you know how there is always that thought in the background, well, maybe somebody miscounted it or somebody else had small portions. Everyone else had small portions. So anyway, when I saw a request for the multiplication testimonies on the Inside Out Training and Equipping School group wall, I mentioned to the Holy Spirit that it would be cool to see it when there is no doubt. Well, when I got home from work today, I got what I asked for. Earlier that day, I went shopping during lunch, as I usually do. I had a coupon for $150 off, one loaf of bread, so I picked it up, a single loaf of bread, as well as some other things, 12 items in total. Then, much to my surprise, while I'm packing the groceries, I noticed that I had two loaves of bread. I asked my family if any of them had bought bread and put it in my car. That would have been weird, since they don't drive my car. Then I checked my receipt, and there was only one loaf of bread in the receipt, not two. Now all I can say is a befuddled, thank you, Lord, <laughs> thank you, Holy Ghost, and thank you, Jesus. All right. So let's just share, we're just going to share a couple more. This one is from one of our trainers. Her name is Maya. Uh, she said, uh, when I first started healing ministry, I got a lot of requests for prayer out of town. My tiny gas budget didn't really have room in it for out-of-town trips. But I decided I was just going to trust God to provide. He equips the called, right? All right. So one day I got a call. I got a house call in a town that was about 30 minutes away. Uh, but when I started my car, it was on E. I wasn't sure whether I'd, I'd even make it to the gas station. So I prayed for a quarter of a tank of gas. As I headed to the gas station, the gas gauge went up to a quarter of a tank, and then it stopped. Uh, since it was still at a quarter of a tank when I got to the gas station, I decided I was just going to keep going. I wanted to see if it was a multiplication miracle or if it was just a broken gas gauge. Um, if it was broken, I figured I'd run out of gas pretty soon. So I drove all the way back home, and it was still at a quarter of a tank. The next day, I had to go 60 miles up into the mountains. So I figured that if it was a broken gas gauge, I'd know for sure. Uh, I drove all the way up the mountains and back, a 120-mile round trip, and it was still a quarter of a tank. I drove the entire month with the gas gauge, never once budging and never breaking down or needing to stop to get more gas. 
And then here's one last testimony from Lana Blowers. She's a member of Inside Out. She wrote, I put, a, I put a wine glass half full of water on my counter, believing for the water to turn into wine. Previously, I had a five-inch dish, a five-inch deep candy dish fill up to overflowing with gold dust and uh, many things in 2014 were manifesting in my house through a wilderness experience, uh, or multiplying rather. So one day father said, check the wine goblet again. I did, but this time the first one was an empty one. Um, no one in the house, but I think I read that wrong. Okay. No one in the house, but me and my husband. Um, I'm just like, <laughs> mess this all up. no one in the house, but me and my husband did not do it. Uh, father then said, uh, things around you will multiply like loaves and fish. So that one was from Lana. So Larissa's going to jump in and she's going to talk a little bit more about multiplication miracles and uh, miracles of provision. In today's class, we're going to look further into the topic of multiplication miracles and miracles of provision. In addition to that, we're also going to discuss how to activate the same type of supernatural provision and multiplication in our own lives. You and I have heard a lot of amazing and practical testimonies, and I don't know about you, but I want to see these types of testimonies become my new normal. I want to latch a hold of them and live it and breathe it. Okay, so we're going to start with um, turning water into wine. We're going we're gonna, to uh, start in the book of John, and we're just going to do a quick review of Jesus' first multiplication miracle and miracle of provision. So this is John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. This is also one of the scriptures that we use in one of our reading the Bible in 3D classes. So on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Uh, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made of wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Uh, the beginning of signs, Jesus, this was the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. So Larissa is going to talk about the need there the need. What we want you to notice is that as we progress through the lesson is that there are some recurring themes that start to emerge as we look at scripture and see these original testimonies from the Bible. Remember, testimony means what? It means do it again. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the how-to part. How do we do it again? How do we do it again? If we are were to flip through the pages of the New Testament, we would see numerous multiplication miracles and miracles of provision. Jesus turning water into wine, Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus feeding the 4,000, Jesus causing the nets of fishermen to nearly burst open because of the abundance of fish, Jesus providing many for the temple tax by telling Peter to go catch a fish and use the coin in his mouth to pay their taxes. These are just a handful of testimonies. So what we see here is that a multiplication miracle or a miracle provision often started out with legitimate need. You and I have made it to that part, at least. We made it to square one because we've all had a legitimate need. I need a job. I need a car. I need a way to pay this bill. I need a way to, to buy these kids some school clothes. I need a way to find how to put food on the table. Everyone last one of us has come had some firsthand experience to what square one looks like. In fact, I'm sure that many of us are there right now. We have a need, a real legitimate need, and we're not really sure how to get 
from here to there. All right, so we're gonna talk about moving past the need because who wants to stay there? I don't wanna stay there. Uh, in just a little bit, we're also gonna open up the floor. If you guys have some testimonies where um, it was a multiplication miracle or a miracle of provision. So if you have any testimonies like that, stay tuned. We are gonna ask for the short version, um, but we're gonna give you opportunities. So um, just keep that in mind. So anyway, the question then is how can we get past square one? How do we move past the need itself? How do we take our natural mind off the need and put on our kingdom thinking cap? Because honestly, our natural mind will keep us perpetually stuck in a place of fear. Uh, that's where our natural mind lives. It lives in fear. Oh, Lord, how am I going to pay this bill? Oh, Lord, how am I going to meet this need? How in the world am I going to stretch my budget? How on earth am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to keep a roof over our head? How am I going to keep... Um, you know, our head above water. How am I going to, how are we going to live? But the mind of Christ doesn't live out of a place of fear, lack, famine. You know, the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ. We already have it. We have everything we're ever going to need in order to accomplish everything that God has asked us to do. It's already in us. He's given us everything we need in order to do it again. God has taken out our heart of stone. He's given us a heart of flesh. He's placed his spirit in us. He's given us his mind, the mind of Christ. He's given us everything we'll need in order to accomplish multiplication miracles, miracles of provision, and anything that we'll ever need for us to, to, um, to do those things. But guess what? He's given it to us in seed form. We have to learn how to walk this out. We have to learn how to release it. He's given it to us, but most believers, myself included, still need to cultivate this particular area of our belief. We have to nurture it uh, so that we can grow in this area and so that we can be more effective. But most of us aren't really doing that. You know, if we, if, and, and even if we are doing that, we're not doing it enough. And how do we know that? Well, you know, honestly, it's evident in the way that we pray, in the way that we pray, oh God, please meet this need. Oh God, please supply. Oh God, please provide. Oh God, please make a way out of no way. And you know what? Just, just me saying that probably offended a whole bunch of people. A whole bunch of people just got uptight and twisted up in their faces because they just said to themselves, well, you know, who does she think she is? What was she even talking about? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to ask. We're supposed to seek. We're supposed to knock. Uh, I'm just doing what God told me to do. I'm just asking him to meet my need. But you know what? You and I don't know who we are yet. We don't know the power that we carry. We don't understand the terms of how God wants us to operate in this. We don't under understand the process of how he wants to move through us. We're not wrapping our mind around the how-to part. God is saying, do it again. And you and I are still saying, you do it. God's saying the, thing, the things I did, you will do also. And we're saying, you do it. You do it, God. You meet this need. You turn water into wine. You feed these 5,000 people. You feed these 4,000 people. You fill up my nets. You go catch the fish. You go find the coin in its mouth. You go pay the taxes. So Larissa's going to jump in here, and she's going to talk about the difference between for and with, because there's a big difference. How do we get to the miracle provision? How do we get to the multiplication miracle? It's co-laboring. You see, there's a difference between the words for and with. Check this out. God. What can you do for me? God, what can you supply? Can you supply this for me? God, can you meet this need for me? Or God, can you do this with me? God, can you supply this with me? God, can you meet this need with me? The Bible calls us co-laborers. Do you know what the prefix co means? It means with. What is a co-worker? It's someone who works with us, not for us. What is co-parenting? 
It's two people who work with each other in order to share the responsibility of parenting a child. What does cooperate mean? It means that we operate with and work with. The Bible says they went out everywhere and preached, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word with accompanying signs. You see, a lot of times you and I are still stuck on four. God, do this for me. God, supply this for me. God, meet this need for me. When God is challenging us to step out and over into the arena of co-laboring, he wants to work with us, not for us. Let me just show you an example. And I also want you to be mindful of, to look at the mindset of what we're looking at here. Okay. So we're going to take a look at the feeding of the 5,000. And I want us to zoom in and take a closer look at that. Um, and I want us to dissect what's really happening here. This is Matthew 14, verses 13 through 14. It says, when Jesus heard it, he departed from there uh, by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. So um, here we have Jesus. You know, he's just come across this multitude of people. He exhibited compassion toward them. He healed their sick. So where's Jesus's mindset right now? Is he moving um, forward in a positive mindset or a negative mindset? He's moving forward in a positive mindset. He's out there. He's doing the work of the Father. He's being busy about the Father's business. He's making a difference. He's touching lives. He's bringing a kingdom mindset. So Larissa's going to show us what happens next. <clears throat> Let's continue reading. <clears throat> Matthew fourteen fifteen says, When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go to the villages and buy themselves food. Okay, so now we see that it's starting to get late in the day. They're out in the middle of nowhere. The disciples are starting to get a little concerned. They're starting to get fidgety. They're wondering, okay, when is he going to wind this up? We need to get these people home. They followed us a long way. There's nothing to eat or drink. It's going to be dark soon. It's, uh, there's no late night Taco Bell out here. <laughs> they felt like they were being positive. In a sense, they were. They were genuinely concerned for the well-being of the crowd, but they weren't thinking supernaturally. All right, so I'm going to um, take that a step further. Larissa, can you guys hear my dog in the background? He's snoring really loud. If, he, if you guys can hear him, I'll, I'll kick him out of here. Can you hear him? <laughs> nope. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, at that particular moment, uh, the disciples, um, you know, they were, thinking of, they were thinking out of their natural minds. They were you know, just being practical, and practical is a safe place. Practical is the place that we often – find ourselves living out of. But if we live in the land of practical, we're rarely ever going to glimpse uh, into the supernatural. So at that point, a multiplication miracle, that wasn't even, they weren't even thinking in that direction. That was not uh, even coming, coming across the screen of their mind. So here's, here's what's so interesting about that. At least some of the disciples, you know, they, they had been there at the wedding feast. They had Physically seeing Jesus multiplying wine, they had seen it with their own eyes. They sat with him. They had drank the wine. They tasted the quality of it. And yet it hadn't begun to sink in that supernatural provision was even accessible to them. So Larissa's going to walk us through. We're going to take a closer look. Okay. So back to Matthew 14, verses 13 through 16. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. And when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. It was evening, and his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place. The hour is late. Send the multitudes away, that we may go into the villages and buy ourselves themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I love that. 
Uh, I love those you do it moments because God gives us a lot of those. And a lot of times we don't even perceive that he is just bouncing the ball right back in our direction. So do you suppose that that may have thrown them for a loop when Jesus said, hey, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. I'm guessing that it did because for most of us, even today, we're not accustomed to thinking that way. We're still in the mindset of you do it, God. You meet this need. You turn this water into wine. You feed these 5,000 people. You feed these 4,000 people. You fill up my nets. You go catch a fish. You find a coin in its mouth. You go pay my taxes. We're still in the mindset of, you know, what do you mean you give them something to eat? We don't have anything. We don't have enough money. We can't do that. We don't have the resources. So we're going to read on. Um, let's see. Um, Verse 17 says, and they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish. So Larissa is going to walk us through their response. So what was their response and where was their focus? Was it on lack or was it an abundance? Again, this is just something to think about. What kind of terminology were they using? Better yet, what kind of terminology are we using? What does our vocabulary sound like? Is it positive or negative? Is it fleshly or is it kingdom? Does it sound like poverty, lack, and famine, or does it sound like increase, multiplication, and abundance? When Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They looked him square in the face and they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, you do it. You meet this need. You supply for them. You take care of this situation. You take care of this problem. You make it happen. You think supernaturally. You think out of abundance. You think out of the mind of Christ. You take on a kingdom mindset. They weren't in the right mindset yet in order to respond to that. So the question then is, are we in the right mindset? When need arises, what are we doing? What are we saying? How are we thinking? Are we thinking kingdom or are we thinking carnal? Are we turning to God and saying, you do it? Or are we owning the fact that God is in us and wants to move through us and will move through us? That's what we do with healing. We don't say, oh, God, please heal this person. We say, be healed. We don't do that with deliverance. We don't say, God, cast this devil out. We say, come out. Why are we still acting brand new when it comes to the area of multiplication miracles? Why are we still looking up rather than in when it comes to supernatural miracles of revision? When God says, you do it, why are we still saying, but God, I only have this junky car. I only have this minimum wage job. I only have this. I only have that. I only have five loads. I only have two fish. Okay. So we're going to read on because um, we want you to see God's grace toward his disciples. See, Jesus knew that they weren't there yet. He knew that they weren't really thinking in the same direction that he was thinking. He knew that it hadn't really taken hold in their hearts yet. He knew that this way of thinking, it wasn't ingrained in them and that they needed to see it again. So this is Matthew 14, verses 16 through 19. It says, but Jesus said to them, "Um, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And he said, and they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two little fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples uh, gave to the multitudes. So Larissa is going to talk to us about that particular teachable moment. So let's look here what happened. First of all, we see Jesus using this as a teachable moment. There was a reason why he had them get their hands on that fish. There was a reason why he had them get their hands on some loaves of bread. There was a reason why he intentionally blessed the bread when he broke it. 
There's a reason why he intentionally mirrored an attitude of gratitude for the two fish and five loaves when, what, that they did have. He was trying to show them and teach them this was an easy miracle. Provision is an easy miracle. We think it is a hard miracle. We think it's something that we have to turn upward rather than inward for. We forget that God is in us. We keep saying, you do it, when Jesus is saying, you feed them, you believe, you trust, you give thanks, you release, you break the bread, you divide it, you pass it out. We have to take a kingdom mindset that is easy. Take on a kingdom mindset that is easy. We have to take some action steps, and we have to look for ways to walk this out. And honestly, I don't know if I'm quite there yet either, but we have to start somewhere to get somewhere. I'm thinking that, that as body believers, we probably haven't let this idea of multiplication miracles really sink down deep inside. The majority of us need to spend some more time with this one. We may need to begin to actively look for opportunities to get activated in this because you know what? These guys touched the bread. They passed out the fish. They drank the wine. It was physically and literally in their hands. As we read on, it says in Matthew 14, 20, so they all ate more filled and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. So again, these 12 disciples had physically touched this food. They'd seen it start out as two fish and five loaves. They had walked the length of that 5,000 person crowd passing out fish and bread. They had seen it multiply right before their eyes. They'd seen Jesus multiply the wine at the wedding at Cana. Their own bellies had been filled with an abundance of bread and fish. They had collected the 12 baskets of excess, abundance and overstock. But much like ourselves, it still wasn't in their hearts. How do we know this? Matthew chapter 15. Okay. Yeah. So in Matthew chapter 15, we see them with the 4,000 people this time instead of the 5,000. So let's take a quick look and see, you know, what they had learned and what they had absorbed from all that, uh, everything that they had experienced, because they had seen a lot. They had, you know, up close and personal firsthand experience. So this is Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 31. It says, Jesus departed from there, uh, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Um, then great multitudes came to him, having with them lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitudes marveled when they saw the mute speaking and the maimed made whole, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So basically, we're just seeing the same scenario play out all over again. There was a great multitude of people. They came to Jesus. Jesus healed them. It wasn't, it, it, it was just a different place and a different group of people. So what happened next? Um, this is Matthew 15, verses 32 through 33. It says, Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness? to fill such a great multitude. What just happened there? <laughs> Let's reread that last verse one more time. Matthew 15, verse 33. Then his disciples said to him, where could we get enough, food, uh, enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? So I'm going to have Lar Larissa jump back in. You know, I just got a revelation as you talked, Cheryl, and it's Jesus wanted to demonstrate that provision is just as easy as healing. He demonstrated healing and he demonstrated provision. And he actually uses food as an analogy for healing. He said that healing is the children's bread. So I just got that little tidbit as you talked and I thought that was good. <laughs> that was good. Okay. So on to the rhetorical question. So what just happened here? We're one chapter over. This wasn't their first time in the rodeo. So what happened? How did the disciples so easily discard everything they'd literally been an eyewitness to and physically participated in themselves? Let's read on. Matthew 15, 34 says, Jesus said to them, 
how many loaves do you have? And they said seven and a few little fish. You see, it's amazing how much grace Jesus extended towards his disciples in this position of scripture. It's really quite beautiful how he is so long suffering with them because he is probably would have been justified in coming unglued. He could have said, what do you mean? Where could we get enough bread in this wilderness to fill such a <laughs> multitude? He could have said, are you serious? Didn't I just walk through this with you? Didn't you just literally hold that fish and bread in your hand and pass it out to the crowd much larger than this? Didn't your own belly just get full? Didn't you just gather up the excess? But no, instead he showed great patience and great compassion. All right. <laughs> so let's be done. This is Matthew 15, verses 36 through 37. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Any of that sound familiar? So again, there are instructions and what we just read, there's a roadmap there. There's a starting place. There's a general idea. Uh, we don't have to just guess on how to do this. There are, uh, there's a lot that we can learn and glean from those particular verses. So here's the how part. Here's the part that we've all been waiting for all night long. Here's the part that the scripture literally teaches us. It's right there in black and white. Here's what they did. This is the blueprint for a multiplication miracle. Number one, Jesus started out, he started out with what was available. He started out with what they had, even if it didn't really seem sufficient, even if it didn't seem practical. Because again, we won't see many miracles if we park our trailer in the land of practical. So that's the first step. He started out with what he had. Then step number two, he gave thanks. Or the little bit that they did have. He didn't grumble. He didn't complain about it. He didn't point to it and say, oh, you know, this little bit, is this all we have? Instead, he took what they had and he gave thanks for it. That's step number two. Then step number three, he released it. He broke it and he passed it along to be handed out. He was teaching them to release what was in their hand. Um, then number four, he was teaching them that by clinging so tightly to that little bit that was in their hand, that they were embracing a poverty mindset, a mindset of lack, a mindset of famine. And then last, he was teaching them that when they learned to give thanks for what they already had, even if it was just a little, when they learned to give thanks for it and begin to share it and release that small measure that they did, did have, that's when the multiplication began to happen. It didn't happen when it was in their hands. It happened when they broke it and when they began to give it away. That's when the excess and the abundance and the overflow and the increase began to happen. That's when their stomachs were filled and that's when they had to gather up baskets. <laughs> so Larissa is going to jump in and she's going to talk about putting that into our reality. How do we pull this into our reality? Uh -huh. Well, rather than seeing the fourth of a tank of gas is probably going to leave you sitting on the side of the road. That's when we put on the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ sees enough gas to last a month and drive up and down through the mountains and take us everywhere we need to go. Rather than fussing about our picked over chicken carcass that's simmering in our soup pot, that we give thanks for it and invite some friends over because the mind of Christ sees a pot of the most delicious chicken and vegetable soup anyone could ever prepare. Okay, so earlier we said that we were going to invite you guys to share some multiplication miracles or some miracles of provision that you may have experienced. We've got some other ones that we want to share, but we would love to open up the floor if any of you have a testimony that you'd like to share. Anybody have anything they'd like to share there? 
If so, just unmute, you know, or you can use that little hand raise symbol. Um, we'd love to hear from at least a couple of you, if you can think of one. I'm sure that you can think of at least one instance where, where God has um, supplied. Let me go over to Josh. He's got his hand raised. Hey, Josh. Hey. Um, uh, I know this, uh, this can't take long or whatever, but um, I have been given, um, uh, I, I'm trying to think of maybe four weeks ago, I was uh, uh, starting to hang up uh, the phone for the night, and then uh, I noticed my hands had two gold spots, and I'm like, hmm, okay, and I just, I moved around thinking I was, you know, are you, are you okay, Josh? Are you, are you doing all right? And, you know, and I'm like, well, I. There's more, there's more. And I was like, wow, I got gold dust. <laughs> I mean, like, there was a lot more, like, like I don't know, like maybe 40 or 30 or something. Well, that's a fun testimony. Thank you for sharing that, Josh. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. I'm going to mute you back and let me go over to Stephen for a second. Let me get him unmuted. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? Good. How you doing? I'm doing good. Do you have a testimony for us? Yeah, this happened... Uh, I can't remember exact the exact year, but it was, I, I want to say 2013, 2014 ish. Uh, my wife and I, we were running low on rent, and uh, like the job, it was during the winter time, I'm trying to set the stage. During the winter time, I think it was December, and we had literally no money pretty much and rent was due and like i don't know our job was going through a, jo a dry spell or something everybody's pay was getting screwed up and uh you know we were kind of like freaking out a lot because you know we had a newborn son and everything and no money and so we, you know, we were talking about what we could possibly do and we kind of left it at that. You know, I, I think we prayed a quick prayer and then just left it at that. And then the next morning I got ready for work and lo and behold, there was like $500 stuffed uh, through my door. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Big deal. <laughs> so... <laughs> That actually helped us. We ended up, I ended up getting a, a bonus from my job also at a later date. So I was able to pay rent and, you know, get Christmas stuff. It was, it, that was pretty awesome. That's, gotta wait for your yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. That was really encouraging. I'm going to go ahead and mute you back. Good to see you on here tonight, Stephen. And let me go over to um, Shirley and, and um, Marvin Yonke. Let me get them unmuted. Hey, guys. Okay, hi. So it's just Shirley. Um, I've got okay. several. Um, we have a family, have some tall kids and some normal-sized kids, and we had to hunt for clothes for the tall kids. Yay, Larissa. <laughs> and she was a recipient of that and her other brother. And... Um, God would just bring us to the places where we needed to be, like the thrift stores for one, two, and three dollars, and and uh, hunting for the perfect that fit. And um, then it was hunting for shoes for her sister. She had a very thin little, what is it, heel, and we hunted and we we found them. And uh, special shoes for waitressing. And then with waitressing, I had a lot of um, times I would just take extra jobs, and sometimes I wouldn't. And and I just saw God's provision. One time I waitressed on a mother and her teenage daughter and they just had like two pops and two Chinese meals and, and they left 50 something dollars, $50 plus um, several ones on the table. I thought, well, did they not pay their bill or did the, she mean, did mean, mean that $50 bill to be a $5 bill? So I, I looked for her and she had already left. And I didn't sense that I did anything extraordinary with her. I just was normal, friendly, happy, serving and running, get extra drinks, napkins, whatever. And um, she paid her bill and, and, and she was gone. And well, that day I found out <laughs> that I had accidentally run over the uh, 
grill that cost $50 plus tax. Um, I had stayed at my son Daniel's house and I had run over his neighbor's grill that cost $50 and some odd cents of tax. So I had to buy a new one for them. Even though I took that grill home and I, I fixed it up and we used it for years. So, I mean, God provides. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Shirley. All right, I'm going to mute you back. Is there anyone else who would like to share? If so, just um, unmute or put up the little hand raise symbol and we'll jump on over to you. I got one. Okay, um, go ahead. I was actually declaring over the finances of the ministry I worked with and just praying in tongues a lot over it. And then one day I redeemed a couple of gift cards for them. And I started with the balance of zero. I added the first gift card, which is $50. And it was 50, of course. And then I added the next gift card, which was $50. And suddenly I had $150. Now, at first there was just like an anxiety that struck me because I'm like, am I really that bad at math? I mean, <laughs> did something happen here? Like, I was trying to figure it out. I was like, nope. I checked it again. I was like, I started at zero. I have 50. I have 50. But God's math apparently is 50 plus 50 equals 150. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I know for myself, uh, I do this frequently. Like um, when I know that I don't have any money in the bank, I'll be driving to the bank and the whole way to the bank, I will be speaking to the ATM machine as if I'm right there in front of it. And I'll just tell it, I'll say, you know what? You are going to produce for me today because I am seated in heavenly places and I am releasing kingdom resources. Uh, I am the bride of Christ. Everything that I have is his. Everything that he has is mine. And I'm not going to live in the land of poverty, lack, and famine. And probably once, it's starting to happen kind of frequently, like maybe once every three or four weeks, I'll do that and I will put my ATM card in knowing that I don't have nothing coming in the natural, but it'll show that I have money in there. I've had it say $20, $50, $80, $200 on three different occasions. And um, and actually, I'm gonna, I, I want to... Um, I want to speak that over you guys' finances right now. Um, so if you, I know a lot of you have online banking. So if you have online banking, I want you to pull up your phone and check and see how much you have right now. Because I'm believing that tomorrow when you go to the bank, you're going to have more than what you had tonight. And um, this is something that I've, I've just recently, I've only ever done this one other, one other time, just spoken this over people, but I, I've never had it work, but I believe that you have to start somewhere in order to get somewhere. So I want you guys to let me know what happens with this because I am expecting. So right now, I just thank you, God, that uh, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. These are people of the household of God. We are kings. We are priests. and um, And we live... In, in, we live under the umbrella of our father. He owns the cattle on 10,000 hills. And I just thank you, God. I just speak a supernatural multiplication into the bank accounts of my brothers and sisters, especially those who might have a need and they're wondering how in the world, <laughs> how in the world am I going to come up with, with this? And I just release that into their finances right now, just supernatural miracles of provision to just be released into their accounts right now. Thank you, Lord. All right, so I want you guys to keep us updated on that. We're going to go back to the manual for a second. And um, we have a couple more testimonies that we want to share from. Um, so I'm going to have Larissa jump in here, and um, she's going to take this next section. Okay. First testimony is from Inside Out Trainer, Melody Moss. She's actually on the call tonight. Hey, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, my son played baseball in college. And during an out-of-state bowl game or bowl? Okay. It's, um, he played football. Okay, bowl game. He was seriously injured, and he was raced to the local hospital. After being admitted, tests showed that he had a lacerated kidney caused by someone's football cleats. Ouch. To make a long story short, there was a mix-up with two insurance companies. I had 
him covered under, and neither of them wanted to pay for his four-day stay in the hospital. I spoke with this woman at the hospital administration and explained her plight. She was very kind. She said she would talk to the board about it and get back to me after their monthly meeting. The important thing was to get my son well. She talked to the board, and I talked to God. I believe in planting seeds and decided that since I needed help with my son's hospital bill, I needed someone to help someone else with their child's hospital bill. I felt impressed to send a check. The Lord showed them out to me to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. I wrote the check, prayed over it in the hallway and outside my son's hospital room and mailed it right away. Then when my son was released, we took him home to recover. A few weeks later, I received a letter from the hospital where he had been treated along with an itemized bill for over $54,000, which, of course, I had no way of paying. Then I read the letter. The hospital was kind enough to waive all the fees except for my portion of the bill, which was $75. That's right, $75. My knees buckled and I collapsed and cried, and the family came to the kitchen wondering who died. I couldn't even speak. I just showed them the letter. Talk about praising God and giving thanks. Amen. I love that one. I really love that one. And then uh, go ahead and take that next one. The testimony of Nathan Spears. I had something happen a couple years ago. I was watching a YouTube video and this guy showed this really nice Liberty Dollar coin. I saw it and said, wow, that's really cool. I wish I had one. Within the, the hour, a package arrived from the UPS. My wife came to the room and handed it to me. I couldn't think of what it might be. I hadn't ordered anything that I can remember, so I opened it up and there was a Silver Liberty $1 coin. I never said anyone, anything to anyone about wanting one of those coins. I called my friends and relatives and they insisted and they hadn't sent it to me. I then tracked the tracking number and it was a tracking number from China. The number came back showing that no such tracking number existed, so God sent me this coin just to say hi. Wow, I get goosebumps with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a great testimony. So anyway, um, just recently, uh, a, a Facebook friend shared a true testimony, a true story about a woman who experienced a modern-day miracle of provision. It's a really short little clip, so I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. And as I do, I want you to remember the meaning of the word testimony. It means do it again. So I'm not sure that there are... I'm not sure whether there are any people on this call who are in need of um, a miracle of provision, but what I want you to see here is two things. Not only is this a do it again type of testimony, it's also a you do it type of testimony. God didn't do this for her. He did this with her. So anyway, here's the testimony. One day I had $5 left to my name. I was sitting in the back of my house with no electricity and praying and asking God what to do. A neighbor knocked on my door. She said she wanted to give me, um, she, she wanted to give my, my cupcakes to her 600 clients for Christmas. She said that every time I made some, she would pay me. She knew I couldn't afford to do all 600 at once. I closed the door and started right then and there with the $5 that I had for food. By that night, I had turned it into $60. Long story short, today the same woman, ah, this chokes me up, the same woman owns a $10 million cupcake company. Why? Because she took that little bit that she did have and she co-labored with God rather than just looking at her $5 and getting stuck in the mindset of poverty, lack, and famine. Instead, she trusted God to help her see the situation through a different lens so that she could walk out a completely different outcome. So, so with that said, um, we redid, the, we, we redid the manual for tonight, so we weren't sure exactly how long it was going to take. So I want to do one more thing. I want to give you guys an activation exercise, because we've given a lot of instruction tonight. We've talked a lot about the how-to part, but I want to take it a little bit further. I want to I actually give you something 
to do here because that's what's going to seal the deal and help this become a normal reality in your life. So first I'm going to just share a quick testimony. This was, um, this happened to me back in 2013. Um, P. Cabrera Jr. had invited me to come and speak at the first Kingdom Awakening Conference in Kansas. So at that time, Inside Out, we were only about a year old and we were just sort of building up some momentum. So that was like a dream come true for me. I, I couldn't even believe that he would even ask me to, to come and speak at that. So from that day, when he first invited me, I began to scrimp and save every penny, which was a challenge because at the time I was working a modest job in retail, not really even making much more than minimum wage. So for months, I saved and I sacrificed and my family sacrificed. And then as I was just about to purchase the ticket for my flight, my car broke down and it was an expensive car repair. It ate up every nickel that I had saved to get the flight for my trip. And honestly, I was devastated. My mind at that time was not thinking in the direction of uh, abundance, excess, increase, and overflow. My mindset was more along the lines of poverty, lack, and famine. So I felt totally discouraged. You know, the time was short. The conference was right around the corner. There was no possible way in the natural that I could have saved up that money again. So anyway, when I finally got myself together and snapped out of my pity party, I decided that I was going to give my way out of that mess. I only had about $10 left. So I decided that I was going to ask God who he wanted me to give that $10 to, believing that when, he, when I gave it away, that he would multiply it back to me. So I carried that $10 around me, with me, wherever I went. And I was, I was just waiting for God to show me the right person to give it to. So one day while I was sitting in my car, a homeless woman tapped on my window. And in my spirit, I just sensed that this was the person that I was to give it to. So after I gave away the $10, the next week I found $32 in that same pocket. So again, I asked God, who should I give this to? And I had decided that each time he multiplied it, I would give away the entire amount until it equaled enough to buy my plane ticket. So I ended up giving the $32 away to a man at the grocery store. And I, I just believed that God was going to continue to multiply it as I continued to give away the entire amount. So incredibly, not many days after having given away the $32, I found another $59 in my pocket. And my flesh was screaming, don't give that away. You need that. Keep that for yourself. That's God's blessing to you. Just save it. Hold on to it. Maybe by some miracle, you know, you'll get enough money together to go to the kingdom awakening. But in my heart, I knew that this money was to be given away and not, and not kept. So I immediately gave it away to a group that I felt like the Lord wanted me to give it to. And then shortly after that was when the real multiplication took place. It was just a normal average day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. The wind was not blowing, not even a gentle breeze. But here's what happened. We have an enormous oak tree in our backyard. And without any warning, a huge limb fell off of that tree and it crushed several of the sections of our fence. And now, mind you, you know, it's, it's not like we have some outrageously elaborate, expensive fence. We don't. It's just your standard backyard wooden fence. A section from Home Depot probably costs around $70, $70 to replace. So anyway, we called our insurance company. They came out, and the woman from the claims department, and she immediately assessed the damage. And even though we had a deductible, the check that she wrote us was still enough to cover the damage to the fence and the cost of my plane ticket. So again, how did that multiplication miracle happen? How did I activate it? I started with what I had. I started with that last $10 that I had left. So you might be thinking, well, what's the point? <laughs> it's not about what we need. It's about what we have. It's not about what we need that's going to get us from here to there. It's about what we have. So I just want to challenge you guys. Um, I'm going to give you an activation that, uh, that I want all of you to considering, consider doing. So here's the challenge. First of all, 
before I go into any of the details of the activation, I want to clarify that this is not the setup for us to take an offering. You know, if you're here today, if you saw the class launch page, you know that we have two free options, one donation option. So this is this has nothing to do with that. We're not building up momentum to ask for uh, an offering. So um, so anyway, the name of this activation is based on 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 10, which is all about being a, a cheerful giver. It talks about how God gives seed to the sower. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 10, it says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So let me read the last verse one more time. It says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So God gives seed to the sower. He gives to us so that we can learn to be cheerful givers because he's a cheerful giver. The mind of Christ is a mind that's wired for cheerful giving. And as we've been learning in many of our other classes, we have the mind of Christ. He loves to break us out of our old mindsets. Maybe before we were counting every bean, we were hoarding every nickel, storing up every dime for our own personal gain. We, we see that exemplified in the parable of the rich fool. I'm not gonna read that, but um, I wanna take you through the steps of the activation. So before we go into this activation, let me just say this. I want you to count the cost before you commit to doing this activation. This activation is really gonna stretch some people. It's going to challenge some of you. And there are probably you know, more than just a few people here today who aren't ready for this sort of challenge. So here's how this works. We've been talking about multiplication miracles and, and uh, starting with what we have. So here's the challenge. We're gonna challenge you to start with $5. If you don't have $5, message us. And if you have PayPal, we'll send you $5. So the $5 is not, is not for you. Once we either give you $5 or you start with $5 of your own, we're gonna challenge you to give it away. And we're gonna challenge you to be sensitive to who the Holy Spirit wants you to give that $5 to. So you're gonna carry around that $5 for however long it takes. It might take a day, it might take a week, it might even take longer, but you're gonna take it to work, to school, or wherever you need to take it until you sense in your heart that God is showing you the person that you're supposed to give that to. And then when you sense in your heart that he's giving you the green light to give it away, that's what, that's what you're going to do. So here's where, here's where it gets a little tricky. Here's where some of you may even want to opt out. See, this activation is not for the faint of heart. It's going to stretch you, especially if you, if you struggled to be a cheerful giver in the past. You're going to have times when you may have wished that you hadn't even participated in this activation, because here's how it's supposed to work. After you give it away the first time, we're going to ask God to multiply it back to you in an increased amount, not just once, but two or three times. And each time it comes back to you in a multiplied amount, we're going to trust you to give it away, the entire amount to whoever it is that the Holy Spirit shows you. If he shows you a friend, then you're going to give it to a friend. If he shows you a complete stranger, then you're going to give it to a complete stranger. If he shows you someone at your church or someone you see who's in great need, then that's the person that you're going to give it to. And trust me, this is not an easy activation. And sure, you know, giving away the, the, the first time and maybe even the second time is not so difficult. But as the amount gets bigger, your flesh is going to kick and scream didn't take much at all for me. When mine got to like $59, I was like, oh, do I keep this? Do I give it away? So you're going to want to keep that unexpected 
check that you receive in the mail. You're going to want to hold on to that refund that came back that maybe you weren't expecting. You're going to want to pocket that overpayment that was sent to you or that $50 bill that, show, that just shows up in, in, your, in, in the coats pocket that you had on last year. And your carnal mind is going, going to want to explain it away as, oh, that's just a windfall. You know, that doesn't fall under the terms of the activation. But remember, the multiplication, it can, it can come back in a wide variety of different ways. It might show up in your bank account. It could be anything. You might notice an overage in your bank account. Maybe two $20 bills show up in your wallet that you know were not just there. Um, I want to read you a testimony from one of our students who, who did the activation uh, one of the other times that we did this class. Uh, after taking this class, I uh, went to the grocery store to buy something um, and, and to give away the money that Cheryl had given to do the Multiplication Miracles Challenge. I talked to God as I drove to the store saying, Lord, show me the person that you want me to give this money to. I don't want to choose just any person. I, wa I want you to pick. So as I got out of the car, I saw a man walking toward me with sort of a sad or maybe even mad look on his face. See, I was trying to use my carnal mind to do the supernatural. Anyway, I spoke and, and he said, I, I spoke and he spoke and I stood there for a moment, but I couldn't work up the nerve to give him the money. Feeling disappointed in myself, I continued into the store, asking the Lord to forgive me for freezing up. So as I walked around the store, I kept saying, help me, Lord, show me who, who am I supposed to give this to? I, I don't even, I don't want to walk out of the store without blessing someone. So as I was standing in the checkout line, I saw an older gel gentleman sitting by the exit. I went over to him and I began to talk to him. I offered him the money, but he said, no. I told him, this is a blessing from God, but he refused to take it. In response, I said, okay, you know, I I'm going to give it to someone else. Are you sure you don't want it? He said, yes, but, you know, thank you. Uh, as I was getting up, his wife yelled from the checkout line, honey, I don't have enough money. You have any money? And he turned to me and said, wow. And uh, now she needed money. I went over to her and placed the money in her hand and said, um, he'll explain, you know, why I'm giving this to you. And I just quickly walked out of the store. Uh, sorry I was so long-winded, but God got the glory and I was blessed double time. So anyway, I want to challenge you guys to do that activation. Uh, keep us updated. Let us know what happens with it. Just start out with Five dollars, and like I said, if you don't have five dollars, just private message me, and I'll send you five dollars through PayPal. And um, I'm going to turn things over to Larissa. Uh, Larissa has been one of our trainers for several years now, um, and I want her to just share some of the things that that God had um, put on her heart about this particular topic. And then after that, we're going to start to wind things up. Sure. Thank you, Cheryl. And one of the things I really loved about tonight's class is that it had an identity focus um, because I believe as the more that we know who we are in Christ, the more the area of provision is going to open up to us because it's connected. In other words, people might think, well, you know, if Jesus were here, then it would be multiplied. But it's just like with healing is people have that mindset, well, if Jesus were here, they'd be healed. But he's in you. <laughs> he is here. <laughs> it's just letting him out. And, and one of the things I've, I've noticed even from where I've grown my own mindset is, is that a poverty mentality is not from God because it limits people, the people of God from stepping out in what God called them to do. Imagine what you could accomplish if you had no lack. Imagine the missionaries that you could help send or, or the kingdom things that you could help finance. Because it's beyond just meeting your own personal needs, but it's building the kingdom. And um, here's a place that a lot of people get stuck is they think, well, the money's the root of all evil. It doesn't say that. It says the love of money is. Money isn't the problem, greed is. And if you got your priorities in right order, you got God first. That's not a problem. And here's, here's a revelation I got recently is where did the struggle with lack start? It started in the garden when they fell. Right after that, God said to Adam, 
that you're going to get fruit from the ground by the sweat of your brow, and now you're going to have thorns and thistles. And the cool thing about redemption, and actually Mark Henderson pointed this one out, he has a blog about supernatural provision, is Jesus wore that crown of thorns for us. Jesus broke the law of sin and death. And something that's really jumped out to me about that is that he is the last Adam, that he took that on himself, that it's actually, it's paralleled to the provision of healing. It's paralleled to the vision of deliverance. He all sees it on the same playing field. And I believe that the more that we see things on the same playing field, the more it's going to become easy for us. And just like Cheryl was talking about earlier with, um, do we speak to the situation or are we asking God to do it? It's where's our mindset with it. Do we know who we are? You know, and, and something that I've, I've seen too is, is when I got the double-mindedness and the fear out of giving, that's where I started to see the increase because everything in the kingdom works by faith. So the more doctrines we could get out of the way that hold us back, i.e., well, isn't money evil, isn't, you know, these ideas that roll around our head, well, does God want me to prosper? And dive into the word of God. What does it really say? And like one even plumb line question we could ask is, did Jesus ever struggle with provision? If he didn't, we don't either. And it, I believe it's the aspect of identity. It's, it's recognizing who we are as kings and priests and who we are as blessed, that we are by faith children of Abraham. And that a king doesn't think minimalistically. A king thinks expansively. And we are kings under the king of kings, Jesus. And we are priests under the order of the king of the priest of righteousness, the king of righteousness, Jesus. That if we're going to learn to walk in supernatural provision, we have to embrace a kingdom mindset. And this is living from a different place. You know, even in the story of the multiplication of the fishes and the loaves, they were still uh, thinking from a carnal mindset. They weren't thinking from a kingdom mindset. They're thinking we don't have enough money. They weren't even on the playing field of multiplication. And, you know, like even with um, Jesus expected them to do some things, like he expected them to calm the storm. Like, and that seemed beyond their pay grade. <laughs> For them, they're like, Jesus, you do it. And he did graciously stepped in for that, but he wants us to grow. And, and one of the things I've, I've noticed about provision is that, you know, what, what you're thankful for multiplies. So whether you quote earned it or whether somebody gave you a gift or something supernaturally happened, thank God and see the increase with that. And now, something that really set me free is a couple years ago, I was at a house meeting and I heard the best offering sermon I ever heard in my life. It wasn't fear. It wasn't manipulation. It wasn't old covenant. It wasn't curse of the law or any of that stuff, but it was simply give because God gave. And then it was like, from that point forward, fear just fell off me. And the more I just, you know, dove in the topic and, and pursued renewing of the mind, it's like, it just became easier and easier and easier. And, you know, I've like, for example, um, just with blessing flowing in my life where it's not even quote a supernatural miracle of multiplication. Um, like I'm getting ready to go to South Africa for a year. And one of the things among many that has happened is I, I had to go and get some clothes for my counseling interview because you got to have formal business attire. And, um, as I went shopping, one of the people with us, she said, put that in my cart. So I did. And then she paid for it. And she said, God told me to pay for that. And it's, 
It's as you step out in obedience to do what you know God has called you to do, expect that God's not going to leave you high and dry, but that he is faithful in that. You know, touching on like, you know, I mentioned the person that preached that just really short snippet on new covenant giving that give because God gave. I said it wasn't old covenant because a lot of people are still stuck under the curse of the law, you know. They believe if they don't give 10%, they're going to be cursed. That God's going to take it from them in some other way, in a hospital bill or something breaking down. But our Father is not like that. You know, to quote somebody else, a lot of people see him as the Godfather rather than God the Father. <laughs> and, you know, and they take that passage from Malachi 4, but they don't read Galatians that says Jesus became Jesus became a curse for us, for as written, any, curses anyone that's hung on a tree. So you can't be cursed. And I believe it's, it's the more that you step out, that you see it from a position that you are blessed in Jesus, that you have every single blessing in Christ, that those blessings start to manifest in your life. Because as you step out in being single-minded in it, as you step out in faith, which is an action, because faith through action is dead, that's where you're going to see the results. And that's, that's what I have to say on the topic. All right. Thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed the class tonight. Um, we have a post on our Facebook group uh, called, So How Was the Class? So we'd love if you would share some feedback tonight. If you, um, Even if it's just a sentence or two, uh, we really appreciate your feedback because when other students see that, maybe even – you know, people who are just joining the group, they get a feel for a little bit about, okay, you know, this looks like it might be worth something looking into. So we want to, you know, just get your honest feedback. And um, I put some links over on the right-hand side of the screen in chat. Um, I'll just go through them really quickly. So the first link is to our donations tab. Um, we have a couple free options. So if you're a first-time student tonight, tonight's totally on the house. This is a free class. Just Enjoy the training, and uh, you know if it looks like something that you might be interested in continuing with, we'd love to have you in future classes. Uh, the second free option is that we have a student ambassador program. Uh, our heart is to be able to make this training available to anybody who's going to run with it, even if you're not able to donate financially. So um, on the class launch page or even over here in these links that I gave you, there's a link for that for the student ambassador program for more details about how to get involved in that. And uh, if, you, if you do that, then you'll be able to take many free, as many free classes as you want. Uh, the third option is, um, you know, if you are not a repeat student, if you're not a student ambassador, we do ask that you make a donation of any amount each time that you take a class. And then the fourth link there is to our audio download section. Uh, like we said earlier on the call, we have over 60 different classes that we have archived. So anytime that you pick up one of the classes that you've missed out on. Um, it's a win-win. You get the information, you get the training, and it blesses the school. It helps us to cover some of our operational expenses. And um, we just want you guys to know that we really love you. We appreciate you. And um, we're thankful that you're enjoying your training. So with that said, I'm going to go over to Joshua for a second. He's one of our students. And um, Joshua, would you be able to, um, to close us out in prayer? Oh, I think I, I think I accidentally muted him back. There you go. No, I was going to say um, that already there, well, we love you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Uh, um, uh, Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing class that we have with the, we were taught by an amazing lady. And she has all the credentials to her that she got from studying your, your word, your word. And we should we give her all the thanks from getting it from you and you giving it to us. We just bless it so much. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Oh, thank you so much, Joshua. We appreciate that. And, you know, I, um, this is just like something I really feel God um, putting on my heart to do right now. Larissa didn't know I was going to do this. But any any donation that's made tonight, I wanna I wanna kind of direct that toward her. So anything that's given tonight, 
is going to go toward um, her, her excursions in Africa. She's going over there as a missionary, and we just want to bless her. So thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the call, and you guys enjoy the rest of your night. Right, God bless. <laughs>